I have lived in southwestern Ontario my entire life. Anybody else? Uh, how many people have lived in southwestern Ontario pretty well their whole life? Oh, a number of foreigners in church this morning. That's great. <laughs> it's from all tongues and tribes and people. So that's, that's fantastic. Glad you're visiting. I, I have found over the years that one of the effects of living in a place for a long period of time is that you tend to take for granted the things that are around you. Uh, I grew up just a few blocks, I grew up in uh, Colchester, so I grew up just a few blocks away from Lake Erie, and so I often don't think much about the amazing resource of water that we've been given in this region. Do you know that Ontario, the province of Ontario, has significant coastlines with four of the five Great Lakes? And roughly those five Great Lakes make up a little over 20% of the world's fresh water. Like 20% of all the world's fresh water is available in the Great Lakes, which we live very close to. That's incredible. One of the most impressive parts of the Great Lakes water system, in my mind, is just a few hours from here. It's a place called Niagara Falls. How many people have been to Niagara Falls? According to NiagaraFalls.ca, as Niagara Falls flows, or sorry, as the Niagara River flows from Lake Erie into Lake Ontario, it hits a point where there's a steep drop-off of 177 feet and an astounding 6 million cubic feet of water flow over the falls on the Canadian side every minute. That's astounding. And because of the incredible and consistent flow of the rate of water over the fall, falls, people have been able to install something called a hydroelectric generator, which provides enough electricity for almost 4 million homes on the Canadian side of things, and a little over 2 million homes on the American side of things. That's an incredible amount of power. And because it's so powerful, it is an amazing sight to see, right? When you go there and you see all the water rushing over the falls and you can hear the roar of the water, it is truly something to experience. And when I consider the height of 177 feet and when I consider the amount of water flowing over the falls, it is mind-boggling to me that people got it into their heads over the years to go over the falls in a barrel. That's incredible. One of the first known survivors of the trip was a lady named Annie Taylor. She was a school teacher from Michigan and she had fallen on some hard financial times and she thought that if she were to do this stunt of going over the falls and somehow survive it, that she would be able to monetize that and make money on it. So. On her 63rd birthday, <laughs> October 24th, 1901, she climbs into an oak barrel and whew, over she went. And from what I could gather online, many people attempted the same feat. Thousands of, did you know that actually thousands of people have gone over Niagara Falls in various different contraptions? And less than 20 people have survived the trip. When you consider the terrain and the forces that are involved, it's amazing that anyone made it at all. It's absolutely astounding. And that's the picture that came to my mind as I was reflecting on this text this morning. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 7 through 18. In these verses, the apostle reminds us of how incredibly fragile we are as human beings. You take, over, uh, you take a trip over Niagara Falls, and you're not coming back. That, that's just reality. Why? Because we're fragile. He tells us how he and his fellow workers have faced things that, have sh that should have been the end of both their life and their faith, but yet they are still standing. I imagine that the Apostle Paul could relate to that feeling of going over Niagara Falls in a barrel and surviving it. His experience has some really important lessons for us as Christians. You see, if we don't know this already, all of us should realize this morning that we are incredibly fragile. 
Well, most of us take daily life for granted, right? Most of us wake up in the morning and it's just another day and we don't give much thought to it. It's absolutely astounding. When you stop and reflect on it, it's absolutely astounding that any of us survive a single day physically. It's absolutely astounding that any of us survive a single day spiritually as well. And the amazing lesson of these verses is that believers in Jesus Christ are indestructible, indestructibly fragile. And the question comes, how can that be? It sounds like a contradiction. It sounds on one hand that the believer is incredibly fragile. On the other hand, you're saying that believers are indestructible. How is that possible? And Paul begins his explanation by teaching us in verses 7 through 11 this first lesson that life and faith are sustained by God's power. It doesn't take much to reveal the fragility of the human condition. And as believers, we should be keenly aware of that. We should be keenly aware of how fragile we are so that we will keep in the forefront of our minds our great need of the Lord. Do you know that you need the Lord this morning? Life and faith are sustained by God's power. Whatever Paul's opinion of himself may have been before he met the Lord on the road to Damascus, we can see here in verse 7 that years of following Jesus have taught him humility. In the first part of verse 7, he writes this. He says, we, that is he and his fellow gospel workers, we have this treasure now that treasure refers back to verse 6 where he talks about Almighty God having shone into our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. We know from the end of chapter 3 that this is accomplished by the work of the Holy Spirit in dwelling and transforming the believer for the purposes of making God's glory known in the world. So you have the Holy Spirit dwelling in you, believer. And He's doing this amazing work in you, believer. And listen, it is impossible to have a treasure of greater worth than that. It's impossible. What could be worth more than God the Holy Spirit living in those that belong to God through faith in the person and work of Jesus Christ? What can be worth more than that? Answer, nothing. Now look at what he says. In the first part of verse 7, he says, We have this treasure in jars of clay. If you're reading in the New King James Version or the New American Standard Version, that will be translated as earthen vessels. These are commonplace works of pottery, he says. And they would be used for a variety of things. And all the commentaries that I read on this text suggested that no matter what those things were made for, no matter what they looked like, no matter what their shape was, they all had two things in common. Number one, they were worth next to nothing. They were incredibly cheap, almost worthless. And number two, they were incredibly fragile. Whether it was a cup or a bowl or a jar, if it was made out of baked clay, it only required a small amount of force to crack or even shatter that vessel into pieces. This is also long before, in the ancient world, this is also long before the invention of crazy glue. <laughs> so, if you dropped your jar or your cup or your bowl that was made of baked clay, if you dropped it on the ground and it shattered, or you lost your favorite coffee cup, there was only one thing to do with it. Since it was so cheap, it was virtually worthless, it wasn't, and, and it was irreparable, you couldn't fix it. There's only one thing to do with it. You sweep up the pieces and you chuck it. You throw it away. So this is the picture that Paul is painting for us here in verse 7. That you have this treasure of infinite worth and it's being kept in a worthless vessel. That's, that's the picture why? Why is that the case? Verse 7, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. 
Treasure being put in a weak, worthless vessel demonstrates the power of God. He goes on to show us what that looks like in verses 8 and 9. He says, we are afflicted in every way. I don't think that's hyperbole for the apostle. We're afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Each of the four examples that he gives us in these two verses should result in the destruction of the fragile vessel. But that doesn't happen. It's sort of like this jar I brought this morning. I, I went to the thrift store the other day and I, I searched the shelves and uh, I, bought this, I bought this jar. It, it cost next to nothing. It cost me a toonie. So this, this was worth $2. And I believe, although I haven't tested it yet, I, I'm, I'm quite convinced it's, I think it's a porcelain jar if I'm understanding this correctly. I'm quite convinced it's rather fragile. So if I take this hammer, I'm, I'm not going to do it. I thought about doing it. I don't know. Maybe I'll change my mind in the next 10 seconds. <clears throat> if I take this hammer and hit this jar, what's going to happen to the jar? It's going to shatter, right? If I throw this jar a little short of the first row there, and now this is a carpeted floor, so it, may, it, it might survive, but all, odds are what's going to happen if I toss this jar way up in the air? It, it, it's going to break, right? If I take this jar and I put it in a vise and I begin to close the vise, what will happen to the jar? The jar will break. Why? Why will this jar break if I do those things to it? Because it's fragile. It can't withstand the forces that are being applied to it. Now, what if it didn't break? What if I took this hammer and I smashed it? Again, I'm, I'm not going to do it, but... Not bad. Survived that. If I took this hammer and I smashed the jar and it didn't break, or if I threw it up in the air and it didn't break, or if I put it in a vise and I started to close it and it didn't break, you'd start to have some questions about the jar, wouldn't you? You'd start to wonder, is the jar really made of porcelain? Is it really fragile? But then what if you examine the jar after it was smashed by a hammer and after it was tossed up in the air, after it was put in a vice? What if you examine the jar and it really was made of porcelain and it still didn't break? What would you have to say then? You'd have to say that something else was at work to keep the jar whole, right? That's what you'd have to say. That's Paul's conclusion about the Holy Spirit being at work in him and his gospel co-workers. Look at verses 10 and 11. He says, We're always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifest in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that the life of Jesus may also be manifest in our mortal flesh. You know, if you look at the life of the Apostle Paul, by the time he writes this book of 2 Corinthians, he should be dead. He should be dead. Or at least, at the very least, he should be very crippled and incapacitated. If you look at the life of the Apostle Paul and all that he's endured up to this point, he should have given up on the ministry of the gospel and faith in Jesus long before this point. How is it that after being constantly given over to death, that he and his companions are still going. And the answer is, is that they are being sustained, they have been and are being sustained by the power of God so that they might make known the life of Christ to the world. That's a miracle that's taking place in the life of the apostle and his companions. When you look at the life of the apostle Paul, or for that matter, any person in the Bible who we would call a hero. We are not, when we look at their lives, we are not supposed to marvel at the strength and perseverance of someone like Paul. To do that would be to miss the point. We're supposed to marvel, when we look at Paul, we're supposed to marvel at the power of God. That's what we're supposed to marvel at. And it's the exact same thing for us. We are all here this morning 
fragile jars of clay. What then is our hope in trial and suffering? What is our hope when, when we experience things that should be more than enough to break us? Things that ought to drive us away from Jesus or at the very least drive us to wallow in despair. Our hope is that God would display His all-surpassing power to keep us from breaking. You know what most people do when they have something treasure, something of worth, a treasure or something valuable? They put it in a container to protect it, right? If you go, actually, our church has a safe. You, you, you've probably never seen it before. But if you go down on the stairs at the back and you go down the bottom, you can see a safe. It's giant! And it's got, it's thick. I, I don't know what we keep in there that's so valuable. But some, it's a thick thing, right? That's what we do. That, that's what we put valuable things in. We put things in containers to keep the treasure safe, right? In, into strong containers. The picture here is quite the opposite. For the Christian, it's not the container keeping the treasure. It's the treasure keeping the container. Some of you know what it's like to be sustained in faith through very trying times. Praise God for you. Because God is displaying His power in you. That's amazing. Now someone might ask, how can we know that's true? How can we know that we will make it? How do we know that we will make it through tomorrow if we have to endure something that is beyond our comprehension? How do we even know we're going to make it through today with our life and faith intact? Those are great questions, and we find a good answer in the next few verses. Knowing that it's the power of God that sustains life and faith, we're also shown here the second lesson, which is this. No affliction can undo the power of Jesus' resurrection. Jesus being alive and reigning in heaven for the good of His people is always true. And no amount of hardship, no amount of hardship can change that. No affliction can undo the power of Jesus' resurrection. Paul continues with the theme of death and life in verse 12 here. So he says, So death is at work in us, but life in you. As he's thinking about all the difficulties he and his fellow workers have faced, he likens it to death being at work in them. And look at the result of that. Look at what it means for the Corinthian believers. It means that life is at work in them. In other words, despite all the trials, despite all the challenges, despite all the sufferings that should have put an end to, life's, or put an end to Paul's life and an end to his ministry, he and his fellow workers are still teaching people about what Jesus has done for them. And once again, he's careful to give credit for God as he continues, give credit to God as he continues in verse 13. He says, since we have this same spirit of faith, according to what has been written, I believed and so I spoke. We also believe and so we also speak. He says that the same spirit that inspired the scriptures is at work in him. Most commentators agree that Paul is quoting here from Psalm 116 verse 10. The author of that psalm finds himself in a tough place, just like the apostle Paul. It says in verse 3 of Psalm 116, listen to what the psalmist says here. It says, The snares of death encompassed me. The pains of Sheol laid hold of me. I suffer in distress and anguish. In that distress and in that anguish, he turns to the Lord. He believes what God says, and then he speaks of God's saving grace. That's exactly what the apostle and his companions are doing here. He's believing God even through great affliction, and he's still speaking to people about the God who saves. At this point in the text, it would be easy to write Paul off as delusional. Why in the world would he continue to persist in something that has been so costly, in something that appears hopeless? He tells us in verse 14. This is tremendous. Look at verse 14 with me. 
So we also, end of verse 13, we also believe and we also speak, verse 14, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. Why does he continue to believe? Why does he continue to share the gospel? Because God has raised Jesus from the dead. Now, the certainty of that for Paul is absolute. It seems to me that the testimony of the Apostle Paul as it relates to the resurrection of Jesus leaves us with only three options regarding the Apostle Paul. Option number one, he's totally delusional. Option number two, he's a liar. Option number three, Jesus is really alive. He really has been raised from the dead. I think we can take being a liar right off the table in terms of the Apostle Paul, because why do people lie? Why, why do people generally lie? Is it not to benefit themselves? Isn't that why people generally lie? I mean, why does a child lie to their parent? To get out of trouble, right? Why does somebody lie at work? To stay away from trouble or to get something or to advance their career? People generally lie to benefit themselves, right? Right? If Paul were lying, that would mean that he was lying for the purpose of losing everything that he valued in his life, of giving it all away. So he would be lying for the purpose of losing everything in his life and then gaining a life of suffering and affliction. Who does that? Nobody does that. So lying is not likely the answer here. No one lies to make their life bad, although that's often the result that lying has, but that's never the motive that people have. Nobody lies to make their life bad. People lie to try and improve their life, right? So if lying isn't the case with the Apostle Paul, that leaves us with delusion or reality of the resurrection of Christ. You may recall as Paul was traveling to Damascus and the Lord Jesus appeared to him, he wasn't alone. There were companions, there were traveling companions with him. And while they don't see everything that Paul sees, they see enough to know that a supernatural event has taken place. We also know that the testimony that Paul has about the resurrection also lines up with the testimony of the other apostles in regards to Jesus' resurrection. So it's very unlikely that multiple people share the same delusion. That's not what delusions generally are like. On top of that, we have a number of letters. In fact, a good chunk of the New Testament is written by the Apostle Paul. And if you've read his letters, you know that they don't read like somebody who's lost his mind. That leaves us with the third option, which is reality. That Jesus truly is raised from the dead. And when you consider the radical life change that takes place in the Apostle Paul, he goes from somebody who is bound and determined to destroy the church of Jesus Christ to somebody who's bound and determined to build the church of Jesus Christ. The only reasonable explanation for that life change is that Jesus is really alive and he's met the Apostle Paul and he was changed by that. By the way, Jesus appears to Paul on more than one occasion in his life. God raising Jesus, it says, also means that he will raise those who belong to Jesus so that they might be brought into the presence of God, leaving the grave behind. Do you know what that means? That means that the believer has an unconquerable hope regardless of whatever else might happen to them. Whether it be persecution, whether it be sickness, whether it be imprisonment, or whether it even be death, nothing can undo the fact that Jesus is alive. And that means that nothing can undo the power of God to raise His people from the dead. When you stop and think about it, there's lots of things in life that we can't change. If it starts raining this afternoon or tomorrow, you and I will not be able to change that. We can't stop the sun from shining. We can't alter the force of gravity. We are quite powerless in the face of many things. Of course, as human beings, we have the capacity to deny reality. Lots of people are doing that these days. We can deny reality, but we have no power to change reality. Do you see that? 
In our day, many people would say that we are arrogant for believing that Christianity is the only true religion in the world. They will say there's so many other options and there's so many other people who are just as convinced as you are that their religion is true. How can you say, how can you be so arrogant to say that Christianity is right and all the other religions in the world are wrong? You ever been confronted by that? I've been confronted with that question a number of times over the years. And my response is this, it is not pride or arrogance that leads me to the convictions that I hold, but rather it is the necessary conclusion that I must arrive at if Jesus is who he says he is. It, it, it's just simply accepting the reality of who Jesus claims to be. It is simply accepting the reality that Jesus is alive, that he died and he was raised from the dead. I can no more deny Jesus being alive than I can deny that the sun rises in the east and it sets in the west. No matter what life may throw at God's people, Jesus is still alive and the power of his resurrection will overcome whatever afflictions we may suffer in this present world. Now knowing that, Knowing that the resurrection is true no matter what happens should have a massive effect on how we see the world as believers. That's the third lesson of our text this morning. The last few verses here show us this third lesson, which is Christian hope is built on things that last. While this present creation has many things, many good things that can be enjoyed to the glory of God, there is no earthly thing that we can hold on to, uh, that we can hold on to forever. Therefore, we must look past what we can see with our eyes and we must look to something that is far better. Christian hope is built on things that last. In these last few verses of the chapter, there's a repeated comparison between what we see and what we can't see. In verse 16, the apostle is talking of what he sees in himself and his gospel companions. Verse 16, look at the first part there. So we do not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away. Our inner self is being renewed day by day. You know, by the time the apostle writes this letter, he has been through the ringer more than once in his life. And he has to be, by the time he reaches this age in his life, he has to be feeling it. Anyone looking at the apostle from the outside would agree with his assessment that he is in fact wasting away. He has suffered much and on top of that, he's getting older. I think it's safe to say that none of us here this morning have experienced anywhere close to what the Apostle Paul experienced in his life. But if we're thinking about this rightly, we will see that we too are wasting away. Our bodies are breaking down, right? As we age, we go through this process of our bodies breaking down and that has an increasing effect upon us. How many people are feeling that this morning? <laughs> Nobody I know who's made it into their 80s says that they can still do all the same things they did in their 20s. I've never met anybody like that. Maybe they're out there. I, I just haven't met them. It's true that we as individuals may experience this in slightly different ways from one another. You may advance in your age farther or faster than I do. I actually think it's probably the other way around. But anyway, we may go at different rates. But listen, we are all on the same train. And the destination is the same for every single person here. And in the face of this, it says... Paul says, we do not lose heart, even though we are out, outwardly wasting away. Why does he say that? He says that because he says our inner self is being renewed day by day. That second part, the first part of the verse, that's true for everybody. Everybody is wasting away. 
The second part of the verse is only true for Christians. Only the Christian has the treasure of the Holy Spirit in this jar of clay called our body who is doing a work in our inner self so that we can enjoy more of who God is day by day. On the outside, it's getting worse. (laughs) On the inside, for the Christian, it's getting better. Our culture has this flipped on its head, right? Most people in our culture care far far more about what they see in the mirror than what's happening in their soul. He continues the comparison in verse 17. He says, For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. It is so strange to me that he writes this as light. When he's talking about his afflictions, he says, They are light and they are momentary. If we were assessing this based on what we could see in the life of the Apostle Paul, we would call it heavy and long-lasting. When you think about your life, I'm sure this is probably true for some people, at least some people here this morning, right? Think about caring for an ailing loved one that goes on for years. Think about countless sleep, sleepless nights. Think about dealing with an unrelenting illness in your own life. Or how about laboring in prayer over loved ones who are lost? Dealing with challenges at work or at school on account of being a Christian that don't seem to go away. Fighting with things like depression and anxiety on a regular ba- basis. Being in a difficult marriage. And the list could go on and on and on. These things seem to be heavy and lasting. How in the world can Paul say that it's light and momentary? His point here is to not make little of the afflictions that face a believer in this world. His point is to make much of the glories of, the, of, of, of being with Jesus in eternity. Imagine for a moment a scale. You know the old school scales that have like a pedestal in the middle and then there's sort of like a teeter-totter and then there's chains or ropes to to baskets, right? Have you seen a scale like that before? Now imagine on one side of the scale there is a ten... Imagine this scale is really big, okay? Really big scale. And on on one side of the scale there's a 10,000 pound weight and you have to stand under it. That's going to feel rather heavy, right? At least for a second. (laughs) Who can lift that weight? Now, imagine on the other side of the scale, there is a weight of 10 million pounds. 10 million pounds. How heavy does the 10,000 pounds feel now? doesn't feel like anything because it's far outweighed by the 10 million pounds, right? The 10,000 pounds has not become less. It has not become any smaller. It is simply outweighed by comparison to the 10 million pounds, right? Here's the thing. We can see in our lives, we can see the 10,000 pounds. But the 10 million pounds is something that we don't see. At least we don't see it yet. And so he goes on in verse 18 and he says this, As we look to the things that are seen, as we look not, rather, to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient. That means they're temporary. They're not lasting. But the things that are unseen are are eternal. You can look through all the world, you can look through all the universe, there is no hope in things that we can see. It's all wearing down. It's all coming to an end. One of the most basic laws in physics is that everything is winding down. Everything is wearing out. And that fits exactly with what the Bible teaches us about this present creation. 
That means that if you only have capacity to trust in what you can see with your eyes, then genuine hope is impossible for you. It's impossible for you. The Christian knows, however, that there is much more to reality than what a human being can perceive with his or her physical senses. Here's where a great many people make a mistake. A great many people think that because something is unseen, it is therefore less real than what you can see with your eyes. That is simply not true. Even this present creation teaches us that that's not true. There are all kinds of things that we can't see with our eyes that are very important to this present creation. Did you know, for example, there is something called cosmic radiation in space? And that that radiation, if allowed to hit planet Earth, would destroy all life on Earth. There, nothing would be able to exist because of the cosmic radiation in space. Did you know that? What we're protected by is the Earth has something called a magnetic field around it, and that, medic, that magnetic field deflects the cosmic radiation. Now, can you see it? No. You can look at a telescope and you can't see the magnetic field. Now, somebody's going to say, well, you can see the northern lights. Okay, fine, I get that. But for the most part, you're not seeing the magnetic field. You're just seeing the effects of it. That's all you're seeing. Right? We, the, the air we breathe, do you see that? No. Is it important to you? Yeah, it's super important to you. Even this present creation teaches us that unseen things are every bit as real as things that we can see with our eyes. It is true that we generally do not see God in this present creation with our eyes, but that does not take away from the reality of his existence. It is true that at present we don't see eternity or what it will look like with our physical eyes. That does not take away from the certainty of its coming. Listen, God has done and is doing amazing things to make himself known to you. He has raised Jesus from the dead. He has called his people from death to life by the power of the Holy Spirit. Do you know why you're here this morning? You're here this morning because the Spirit of God brought you here. Regardless of what else you might think, you're here because God brought you here. He's showing himself to you every day. He's displaying himself in creation day after day and night after night according to Psalm 19 and Romans 1. What are we looking at? this morning as believers? Are we looking at just what we can see with our eyes or are we looking to what is unseen? What would it be like? What would it be like if Christians actually believed what Jesus said? When he said, in my Father's house, there are many rooms. If it were not so, would, have I, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. Do we believe that as Christians? Believing that, brothers and sisters, is the foundation upon which true hope is built because that is something, the place that Jesus is preparing for his people is something that does not fade, it does not wear out, but it is eternal, it lasts forever. If we only look with our physical eyes, we will only see our fragility. At least we should see our fragility when we look with our physical eyes. But if we, by God's grace, can look at what is unseen, then we will see that our life and faith are being sustained by God. We will be able to see that no affliction that comes into our life will be able to change the power of the resurrection of Christ. And we will be able to see that we should build our hope on things that last, not on temporary things. And if those things are true in our lives, then we will know what it is like to be incredibly fragile and yet be indestructible. 
May God do that in us so that it might increase thanksgiving to the glory of God forever. Let's pray. Oh Lord, it is so true that we are so fragile. Any number of things could put an end to us and there's absolutely nothing we can do about it. But in our fragility, Lord, and I, I believe you made us that way on purpose so that we would look not to ourselves, but we would look to you. And you have given this great gift of the Holy Spirit to indwell us, even though we are so fragile. Thank you, God, for giving us this great treasure which keeps us. He keeps us day by day. And I believe he will keep us into eternity. Oh, Lord, I pray that you would give us eyes to see and hearts to understand all that you have done, all that you are doing, and all that you will do in Christ for the sake of your people whom you love. Oh, Lord, this is only possible if you do a work in our hearts and minds. We can't see it. We can't understand it on our own. We are so given to look at the things of this world which are perishing. Oh, God, keep us from that. And help us to look forward. Help us to look into eternity. To things that last. I pray in Jesus name. Amen. Oh uh-huh.